Hello everyone, I'm Nicole van der Hooven, and today I'm joined by two special guests. And I'd like to introduce first, I guess, Stefan Ango, or you might know him better as Capano. Hey Nicole, thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. You can call me Capano. I fi I'm fine with that. So Stefan is a designer and an engineer, and most recently he was he was announced to be the CEO of Obsidian, so that's going to be interesting. I actually know you more for the stuff that you've made for Obsidian, like Minimal and also Hider and Web Clipper. But it looks like you've been in the industry for a while making, I'd say, similar tools. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, up until now, it wasn't really... Um... Uh, in the consumer space, I was building startups in more in the B2B area. Um, but I've been using a lot of these tools for a long time. So uh, as a user, I'm, I'm older than I look, I guess. I've been like building, I think the first thing that I really got into when I was a teenager was Winamp skins. And so like, uh, this is like, 90s early 2000s uh making my first websites and things around that time so that's how uh that was my first i guess experience like building things in the software world awesome and also here to help me interview you basically is andy <laughs> Pullane, who is a lot of things designer <laughs> educator writer design leadership coach He's also co-authored a book called Service Design from Insight to Implementation. And he has a podcast called Power of Ten. But really, he, the most important thing is he's my dungeon master. We play D&D &D <laughs> every week and also a good friend. We actually met because of Obsidian. So welcome to the channel. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to be a, a co-host or co-interviewer. Co -interviewer. Yeah, it's it's really weird for me to um, not take cues from you and roll dice when you tell me to, but you know, we'll see how that goes. I've, I've got the dice here just in case we we need. Okay, them, well, so. I, I've got mine too. <laughs> so anytime you need me to roll a save, I'm ready. Or we'll just roll for initiative to see who interviews first, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's let's do let's do that. Rollies. What are you going to roll? Okay, just a d twenty. Okay, I rolled yeah, a two. Yeah. So I got an eleven. <clears throat> you go uh, first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Um, I will. So um, the really the first question for you is it's kind of under a sort of batch of questions really about why Obsidian. But um, how did you get started with Obsidian? First, can you give me any like buffs or stats or anything as my character? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you so, definitely get sort of plus what... one in in design and coding, okay. right? So, you know, <laughs> what class do you think Stefan would be, Andy? Wizard, I reckon, or an arcane. Yeah, I was no, thinking I reckon, or, like or, or, yeah. sorcerer. Yeah, or a, or a um, uh, you know, someone who kind of makes stuff as well. Artificer. Uh, artificer. Yeah, that's what I reckon he is. Back in the so World high of Warcraft end. days, I played a lot of uh, the Paladin class. Okay. But I think that uh, I, I also, in like Lord of the Rings, really love, you know, uh, Gandalf and the, those types of guys. Yeah. Radagast, okay. you know, I'm, I'm definitely into those types of characters. Some, someone who can produce something out of nothing. So, mm -hmm. so. I forgot you what your were. question was. <laughs> yeah, so I was just going to lose <laughs> half, the, half the audience straight away. Um, so, you know, you were a customer, right? You were a user before you uh, um, became CEO. And um, pretty quickly, I seem to remember seeing your, um, certainly your theme, I think probably a couple of other things, seeing you on the in the Obsidian Discord. So, you know, what was your hook into Obsidian in the first place? Um, we're getting some comments that your mic is very crackly. Uh, uh, if we are hearing it. It's yeah, weird, isn't yeah, yeah. it? I had it before. Some, some people yeah. are hearing it. Um, Don't know what's but, going on. Um, to answer your question, I had been using the over the past like 15 or so years, I've used a lot of different tools to kind of try to solve what for me was mostly a journaling question. So I wanted to be able to just write kind of my own diary notes in a tool that over time I discovered that the wiki type of format was what I really loved. I kind of fell in love with the the wiki link kind of uh, idea 
And that idea has been around, I, I'm not sure exactly who invented the notation. I think it was the, the, the Wikipedia people in the media wiki, the kind of like double bracket concept. Mm. But once I discovered that, I felt that I only wanted to use like journaling with that. So the one that I used for a long time was TiddlyWiki. And um, TiddlyWiki has that same kind of bracket notation. But I found that my personal sensibilities as a user, I really wanted something that felt like very simple and minimalistic, like you, as you may notice from the kind of like type of themes and things that I've made for Obsidian. And when Obsidian came out, I found out about it almost right away, um, like in, I guess, April um, 2020, you know, as right as the pandemic was kicking off, like, I think a lot of people, I don't know, around that time, were staying at home, were exploring different things. And I found out about it. And it, I had spent probably a year trying to kind of customize the Lee Wiki to be a little bit more user friendly. And Obsidian even in like V1 or whatever, uh, not V1, it was like V0.001 was already better than what TiddlyWiki was doing for me in terms of it had the quick switcher, it had the the prompts, it had the file nav in the way that I wanted. It didn't quite look like what I wanted, but it had a lot of the kind of nice uh, user interface patterns that I was looking for. And so I pretty much started making, it took... I was looking back at my notes, kind of preparing for this conversation, and I pretty much went all in on Obsidian after using it just for a couple of days. And I imported everything and started making the minimal theme like immediately. Um, but I wasn't just making it for myself at first. I wasn't intending to publish it. I just kind of made it uh, to solve my own UI preferences. So I actually used TiddlyWiki quite a bit. The reason that I used it was a lot of, because I was a consultant at the time, and a lot of the tools that were out there required, like, it, they were basically on the cloud. So it was a SaaS platform that I'd have to log into, and not, and those sites weren't always allowed by whatever company I, I happened to be working for. So that's what I loved about TiddlyWiki, that it could just sit on, like, a, a flash drive, and it would work. And that's part of the reason that I started using Obsidian too, is because it's local. Yeah, yeah, and that that was something you know, being able to use it on your uh, computer when you're offline, just having that control. I, I was, uh, you know, using it on flights, and and so that local first idea to me is, I don't know, I, I just find it much more natural, and it allows mm-hmm. you to to do things uh, so much faster and. Because I have experience, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that like being an engineer is uh, first and foremost what I do, but I do dabble in a lot of uh, different things on the code side and using, um, I use Sublime Text as my main um, code editor, but having, being used to using like a code editor, you just expect everything to be there for you right away, super fast, like even a small delay feels like it gets in the way of my productivity in in some some cases so being in the cloud it always feels a little slow and i've i've used a lot of those tools in my previous especially for work purposes like confluence or google docs or those things and the sluggishness i feel like really gets in the way of being able to make progress on whatever you're trying to do yeah I mean, for me, it was uh, it's the portability thing. I, I switched to Markdown for, for everything, I think, for my blog, like really, really yeah. soon after Gruber kind of uh, released it. And um, I used to use uh, Notational Velocity, which I think was probably one of the first ones I know of, of a kind of this idea of a database that just sits on top of a bunch of Markdown files. And then uh, Brett Terpstra was putting together NVAlt um, and NVUltra, <clears throat> which is he's still working on. Um, and, you know, I've been pretty uh, disloyal. So I've used lots and lots of like every, and probably most people, every Markdown app out there. And a lot of them are starting to do the kind of wiki thing too. Um, but uh, And there's so many of them. Me. And Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think that is such a great thing that now the, the ecosystem of Markdown editing uh, tools is so um, deep and broad that 
I often think that Obsidian, to me, what's exciting about uh, this whole kind of area is like, I'm very curious about how we can make digital information persist over long a long period of time. Like how will the ideas that we have right now continue to persist for hundreds of years in the future? Like, we've had books for thousands of years, but we've only had digital files for, you know, 70 or 80 years. And I like the idea that something like plain text could still be around for the next yeah. few hundred years. And so using something like Markdown is like the, the file in a way is, is way more important than the apps. Like Obsidian will eventually become obsolete because technology changes so much. Uh, but hopefully the plain text will, will continue to be to live forever. Yeah. I mean, a bit like you, I'm going to ask you about computer show actually later, but a bit like you've been around oh, okay. for quite a long time and I thought I've been in digital stuff for like 30 something years and <clears throat> I got fed up. But one of the things, the reasons I moved to doing everything, I do all I still do my invoicing, you know, with Markdown and, and, um, and stuff because I had so many times where like, oh, the app's gone out of, you know, out of production or um, I've got so much of my work still on like CD-ROMs. I keep an old laptop that's still got a CD-ROM drive just in order to that's get, really, you know, you still run this kind of like OS 8. No, well, uh, yeah, but so some, some of it's like director, Macromedia Mac, 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 actually, it's Macromedia director stuff. That, that's the only thing it can play on. So you sort of have to keep the machine for it too. Um, and I transferred a lot of other stuff, but I had the same thing and I started using Evernote once and then trying getting stuff out of it was horrendous. I had the same thing with notions of exporting out of notion and it kind of dumps all this other crap in there. And um, so, you know, yeah, so I agree. I think the, the, the file format is, is the kind of winner. I, I'm interested yeah, though, as CEO that so. you've got, you know, there are a whole lot of, well, I kind of would perhaps a little bit rudely say uh, obsidian clones kind of popping up mm. it feels like in the last you know um even in the last year there's been a lot of stuff coming up so you know whether you perceive those is is that a challenge for obsidian is, uh, is obsidian kind of sort of just take its own path but each of them have their kind of own flavors now is it a good do you see it as a good thing well i see it as a good thing because i am still kind of like a plain text maximalist so i think that you have to have a diversity of clients in order for that to kind of last forever. Like I still think the file is more important than the app. I do think that where it gets dangerous is if there's too many app specific um, syntaxes that start to emerge, I think that is kind of dangerous because it reduces interoperability. I like, I think that, you know, Markdown for, for all its flaws. And I think a lot of people have frustrations with Markdown it has kind of stood the test of time, at least for the past however many 12, 15 years it's been around. I'm not exactly sure, but maybe more at this point, I'm getting old. Um, and so I think that that is one of the biggest challenges that we have with Obsidian is sometimes we want to do something new. Like recently we launched the Canvas feature and there isn't a you know off the shelf kind of Canvas type of file format. So we, you know, created a new one that is, you know, open and the, the, the type specification for it is out there, but there's no other client for that file format yet. I, hopefully there will be, but I think that that diversity of um, clients is good because uh, there's a lot of people who have lots of different ideas about how thinking should work. And Obsidian is not particularly dogmatic, like a big part of you know, one of the main values that we always think about is extensibility. So how do we make it easy for individual users to customize Obsidian? Um, and also how do we enable developers to build on top of it? But there's a, uh, I think it's very viable to create a very opinionated um, markdown or tool, you know, editing tool that takes a different approach than Obsidian. And I've seen many uh, people who enjoy using more than one different one for different parts of their workflow. So, yeah, I think it's good. I think we're living through a little bit of like this Cambrian explosion moment because for some reason right now in the past couple of years, like people have realized this is a really exciting problem to work on. And, and I think we all learn a lot from each other. So I, I see it as a good thing. 
So one of the things that you said, because I trolled through your blog while I was thinking of questions for this, um, you had a post about how great tools choose to be bad at some things. So mm. what do you think Obsidian has chosen to be bad at? Well, I think that design principles are only real design principles if you can take both sides of it and create something compelling. Like, for example, we talked about extensibility. That's one of our, I, I would say there's like three major pillars to what Obsidian is trying to be. One of them is around privacy. One of them is around longevity of your notes. And one of them is around extensibility. So those three things are the things that we want to continue being really good at. Um, but you can take the extensibility uh, example as, as kind of one of our design principles. We want to make Obsidian super extensible, but you could, I, I can see why some people would prefer an app that's not at all extensible, that is, you know, completely designed by one small group of people who are trying to make a very cohesive experience. I think one of the big challenges with Obsidian is we're always asking ourselves what should be a community plugin versus a core plugin. We're always asking ourselves, how can we make community plugins feel more um, native to the app and more cohesive and intuitive to people? Do they, do they mix, make sense with the rest of the app? Because any developer can basically build anything inside of Obsidian. And so it, I think it is a common point of frustration for some new Obsidian users that they have to download a lot of plugins and some of them feel a little janky. So, you know, Obsidian has chosen to be bad at that with the trade-off that it allows a lot of freedom for people to customize the app. Mm -hmm. um, and you can take the same example with, um, uh, you know, privacy and longevity. Those, those have their own trade-offs as well. Uh, Andy, did you want to say something? I was thinking, you know, um, it reminded me of, what you just said it was just as you talked about the plugin thing one of the one of the tricks that apple did with the iphone was to make the phone bit an app right? and it sounds just like sort of really banal thing but up until right. then there were phones smartphones were kind of phones with sort of app bits in them and they were really janky and um i think one of the things also obviously not having a keyboard having a touch screen means that that, that thing where you get whatever mm. app you're in is completely the app all right, so you know, I'm I'm in FaceTime. It's completely FaceTime. I'm in I'm in uh, Obsidian, and it's completely Obsidian. The whole phone turns into whatever app you're in, and I feel that um, you know, in a way, that's what the plugin mechanism can do for Obsidian at its base. It's you know, it's a text editor that's that's browsing a and as a viewer on a, a set of Markdown files, but you know, as soon as you start putting, particularly some of the more uh, powerful plugins in it, it becomes something completely else. And I think I find it really kind of powerful that you can switch that stuff on and off. I can see that the, you know, I, I was showing my students the other day because they're talking about design research and how you can use Obsidian and quite a lot of them use Notion. And I can completely see mm -hmm. why they use Notion, right? Because it's just, you know, zero um, learning curve for them um, until such time as they, <laughs> they want to take that stuff with them uh, and then they'll find out. Um, and I think some of that stuff is a bit like doing backups. You find out the hard way, right? But I, I, I kind of feel like that is a, um, it's been a smart um, trade-off to make with Obsidian, with the plugins. And I was yeah. just wondering. But it, and, a and point it, has, it's, it has its downsides. I mean, the, the, yeah. I think the point, um, uh, you know, on privacy, the way we think about that is that it is having ownership over your files. They're not in somebody yeah. else's database. They're on your computer, on your device. Um, you know, if you choose to use the, the first party sync, um, everything's end-to-end -end encrypted. And so we have this kind of strong pillar around privacy, but yeah. it has the trade-off that it makes certain things harder for us. For example, people ask us, um, do you, would we ever see a web client for Obsidian, a like uh, online, you know, cloud-based Obsidian? And that's a lot harder for us to do because we don't have access to your files. We would have to compromise on that value of encrypting your data and kind of being able to see that information on our side in order to be able to present it back to you. And that makes things uh, really tough unless th there's some, we've thought about this question a lot, but it really is a very hard problem to solve. But for someone who, you know, for whatever 
scenario they might be in either can't access a local app because they, you know, their work computer restricts, um, you know, apps and they can't download Obsidian or they're on a school computer and they have to access it from, from the school computer. Um, it does, it does present the limitation, but I think strong principles force those kinds of trade-offs where you, you could take either side and make a compelling and legitimate app. We just, you know, have chosen our own particular set of trade-off and that's what that, that blog post was about. Um, so there's, so there's other things that Obsidian is bad at as well, like relating to longevity and like the choice of using Markdown, for example, it's not the most intuitive to some people. Uh, I can, I can come up with a long list of things that Obsidian is bad at, bad at in favor of something that it wants to be really good at. And I think that's a making trade-offs is our job. One of the things that I hear a lot is that Obsidian is too developer focused or some people yeah. think it's not approachable. And I think it comes back to what we've been talking about. You do have to make a decision. You do sacrifice a little bit of usability in exchange for flexibility and modularity. I, my background is in performance engineering. So I care a lot about performance and I, I love this idea of making the most streamlined possible app and then just leaving room for extensions so that other people can make their own decisions. I would rather have that than have an app that has everything baked in and I have really no choice as to what to turn on or off because I'm, my use case is going to be different from everybody else's. Well, that's Microsoft Word, right? Uh, when you just <laughs> yeah. have that, that sort of bloat and you know, they get those screenshots sometimes of every palette open and there's about this much space to yeah. actually edit some text. <laughs> By the way, do you like my shirt? <laughs> oh, yes. Classic. This is, Where's uh, yours? Yeah, I, How disappointing. I know, I uh, I'm such That's a minimalist. A I, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, gotten my uh, Obsidian merch yet, uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, you're looking good over there. So, you know, you've been contributing to Obsidian uh, pretty much from the get-go. Uh, and then you started uh, working with, with them. Um, what, um, why is it with them? It's, it's the, the two, Laika and Silver, basically. It's it's small, the, the yeah, it's a small team. team. Um, so, you know, how did that, I don't know how much you, were, you can reveal, how did that come about? And then, and what was the sort of transition? When was there this kind of moment of like, hey, how about becoming CEO? Yeah. Uh, well, it was a very organic process because I, you know, was running a different company uh, at the time when Obsidian first came out. And so I had, you know, started building minimal theme, a bunch of different small plugins here and there, the web clipper. And uh, I was very vocal in the discord and forum about some of the things that I thought would be, you know, improvements or bug fixes. Um, and at the time, the, the Obsidian community was way smaller than it than it is today, um, and so I I was often interacting with um, <laughs> Lee Cat and and Silver, the uh, founders of Obsidian, through the Discord, and just kind of just talking very organically about here are some things that could be improved. Here are some um, you know bug bugs I found. Can you help me with? this feature of minimal that I am trying to, you know, build into my plugin. Can you give me some feedback on how to do this uh, properly? And so we, we started interacting, you know, talking about it, Obsidian for a couple of years. And I, I'm not exactly sure at what point um, it started. And maybe it was around the time that I'm, tr I'm trying to like actually remember, but I think there was like a gems of the year contest um, where minimal won like the best theme category, and I, I think I started DMing more with with um, Silver and Leakat around that time, and just kind of getting to know them just over over chat in Discord. Um, and they found out that I had been you know running some startups and asked me for some advice on a couple small things here and there. I, and and so we just kind of kept that conversation going. And at some point last year, um, there was this kind of idea that uh, Obsidian wanted to kind of reach the 1.0 release. And the, the 1.0 release, I mean, I think, it, it, you know, it's funny that it, 
it, it was really a milestone moment because we, as a, that's when I started becoming involved in the, the project. Um, and they asked me to basically uh, create the new default theme. Um, and so I was working with them part-time, kind of taking a lot of my experience uh, on minimal and bring that into the core app. But also they were asking me about some of the, the things that I felt were on my like top priority list of small details that we felt were still kind of embarrassing or like wanted to really get nailed down before we could really feel like we could call it a 1.0. And, um, that's when I started working much more closely uh, with them, as well as Liam, who is now a full-time part of the team. You might know Liam from the calendar plugin. He's amazing. We have basically five people full-time. Um, Joe Thai, you might have seen around the community, who helps a lot with plugin reviews and the, the developer um, ecosystem. Um, and then a few other folks who've been helping us part-time, like MG Myers, who you might know from the Kanban plugin um, and style settings is working on, has been working on Canvas and and kind of like led the Canvas effort. Um, and so the more conversations kept going on with this project, um, I just realized it was so much fun and I love Obsidian so much. Like I just, I really want it to, continue to be an important tool in my life in a very selfish way. But also I, I think that um, Sheeta and Erica, Lee, Lee Cat and Silver are such mature like entrepreneurs. They're quite a bit younger than me. They make me feel old all the time, uh, but it's a great exchange of, of knowledge. And, um, and yeah, so we started discussing this idea um, and they were on board. I think it's a very, we're, we have very complementary skills. Um, I'm really excited about like Lee Katz, one of the most incredible engineers that I've ever worked with. I've worked with a lot of like amazing engineers throughout my life. And I have like so much respect for him. He's just uh, super, super impressive and continues to be like, they're both going to continue to be involved uh, for the foreseeable future. And Erica has just an incredible mind for, um, you know, product and how to how to think about what users really care about. And so, uh, and and has been, I think, the person who's in in a way influenced why Obsidian has such an amazing community more than anybody else. Um, just kind of from the beginning, making that an important part of Obsidian, I think, is is a lot of credit to Erica. So. Um, seeing, getting to know them just made me realize like there's nothing that I would rather do than help that community continue to grow, help make sure that Obsidian has the kind of like uh, structure that it can last for a long time, kind of going back to that principle of longevity that matters at the app level. How do we actually make that um, viable at the, at the company level so that the kind of uh, the product and the company can be aligned. Um, so I yeah, also just kind of wanted family, to call like out very organic. There are oh, some people who are asking where we get the merch, by the way, I bought this <laughs> and it <laughs> is here <laughs> Yeah, just so everybody can see. Cause there's some awesome things on there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, want to, I wanted nice to ask better. you, yeah. yeah, it is. So I wanted to also ask you um, earlier when I was introducing you, I said that you have worked in similar spaces, which I realize now is a bit odd because the the companies that you you had worked on before aren't note taking apps. But what I meant by that is actually I'm seeing a theme in what you've worked on. And it's all about creating things that are minimal, intentional well-made. And mm -hmm. I think like in your previous company, Lumi, you were talking about packaging and making that a little bit more transparent and intentional as well. Um, I know you're also an, an industrial designer or you, you claim not to be one anymore, but um, that's also something that permeates your work there as well, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I'm 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 a uh, I'm a generalist. I like to dabble in a lot of different things, and so it has taken me in a lot of different directions. But I think the common theme is I've always been interested in making tools. So everything basically in my professional career has been a tool of some kind. Um, so in the case of Lumi, it was a tool. It was actually two different tools. One was for factories to help um, manufacturers kind of uh, bring their capabilities online, and a tool that helped businesses who need to collaborate with manufacturers find the right manufacturers and work with them um and so i like building tools that kind of empower individuals to do something that they couldn't do before um and so obsidian definitely fits into that because i feel like i mean in my own personal life it's been so uh rewarding and exciting to use obsidian like i feel like my thought process is clearer and more reliable when I'm using Obsidian. And I feel like that's such an exciting superpower that I have that I want to help more people get that feeling too. Um, so yeah, like throughout my life, basically like that, that theme just keeps coming back of like making tools that help other people do whatever they're trying to do. And it's also helping other people make, make other things right because like you know you you've also um worked on things like like that kind of pare down what what is out mm. there because there's so there's an information overload that's out there and i know you've made like tidy which kind mm. of streamlines what we even see on on the page um what do you think, is there anything in Obsidian, because we've talked about things that it's bad at, are there any big features that you'd like to introduce to it that don't detract from, that don't make it like this bloated bit of software, but still, still are along the same lines of being intentional and helping people? Uh, definitely. I think that the area we want to keep working on is the the primitives like what are the basic things that you can use that you can build on top of um so we have a public roadmap that's not always the most up to date um but one of the big things we're working on right now is around metadata so a lot of i'm a huge fan in my personal use of um, data view is one of my favorite plugins for obsidian and i use it for everything um and kind of asking ourselves like, what can we do that would enable the, the user and developer ecosystem of Obsidian to leverage metadata even more? Um, so, you know, you can, there's a couple different ways that you can add metadata to your notes with Obsidian. One of them is through YAML um, in the, the, the front matter. And one of them is through data view has these like custom fields. So that's an area that we we want to, like the, the author of data view had to create this new notation with the double colon, um, you know, uh, you put a key and a value and separate them with a double colon. And that notation was essentially invented by the author of data view because it's so painful to write YAML. And so what can we do to uh, clean that up a little bit and make metadata feel more like a, a first class citizen in the, uh, from the user's perspective, but also um, enable more developers to build on top of that. Um, yeah, API docs and developer portal. I'm, I'm looking, I can't even remember what we have on here. Tasks. There's a few other things <laughs> that we have uh, up our sleeve at the moment that uh, I'll, I'll be excited to share in a little, in a little bit. Um, <laughs> talking Quick about questions, the Stefan. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you mentioned data view. I know that he's working yeah. on data core, right? Is that going to be something that's going to be built into Obsidian or is it still going to be a community plugin? Honestly, I would never use Obsidian without data view. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't really, I'm not exactly sure what the goals of data core are. I, I, I'm not super informed about what he's trying to do with that. I think that our job, is always to find the right balance between what feels like a core plugin, what feels uh, like it should be part of the community. And so I think that long term, we do want to have uh, good ways for people to um, add metadata to their notes 
and perhaps view um, kind of an output of that in some way. I think that's a kind of a long-term project, but in the short term, the metadata improvements is really about making it a lot easier to add metadata to your notes and um, and then hopefully that makes things like data view uh, easier to use. Um, but maybe long term we'll consider some some more ways that people can like look and oh, view their data uh, or the metadata from their notes. Uh, I do find that data view one challenge with it is it, it is pretty um, nerdy. Like it does require it has a syntax that's a little bit you know like SQL, and I think that that's not the most user friendly. So we've seen quite a few plugins pop up. Like DB folder is one that's kind of interesting that that makes it a little bit more WYSIWYG. And, and that's one of the big benefits that, that we have as a community is that people can build plugins that, that optimize for different types of users. People who, are, who love writing SQL, they're going to love using data view, but people who prefer something more WYSIWYG are going to prefer uh, a different type of UI. And we can, we can be patient in our approach to what we actually want to build into the core because we could just kind of watch what people like, what people make, and decide later down the road what we want to build ourselves. Do you do you think there are? I mean, are there any plans to, to to then grow the team, or is is partly what makes it special the fact that you are a very small team? I think that for now we want to stay really small. We want to be as small as we can be because. Mm. Um, you know, one of the other things that's really important that made me want to join Obsidian is that from an early stage, um, Chita and Erica decided that they didn't want to bring on investors, um, like venture capital yeah. investors. And I've, I have throughout my career worked and built companies that have used every single funding model under the sun. Like my first company was one of the very first Kickstarter campaigns ever. Um, Back in 2009, I've I've gone down the venture capital route. I've done bootstrapping. Like I've tried it all, and I think when it comes to the the goals of Obsidian that we've been talking about, like longevity in particular, comes to mind. But also privacy and extensibility, I find that is not very compatible with the VC route. And um. You know, if you just kind of survey the ecosystem, you'll find that actually almost all of the kind of big PKM apps, if you want to call them that, have mm -hmm. raised a lot of money, like millions of dollars from or hundreds of millions of dollars even. And the, the problem with that is that I think it's misaligning the incentives in, in the long term for, um, you know, uh, the user and how they want to uh, kind of store their notes. Like basically it incentivizes certain behaviors that are kind of against our principles. And so for that reason, we're trying to build very intentionally and also uh, work through the extensibility part of our like principle to enable the community to customize things more. Like we don't feel like it's necessarily our job to make this like huge app that has every single feature. We like seeing how the community kind of yeah. extends Obsidian in their own ways. So yeah. I, I would say that um, growing the team, it will be more by necessity than by a desire to like try to do everything ourselves. Um, we're getting to a point now where I would guess we don't actually even know how many Obsidian users there are because we're so focused on privacy. We don't have analytics. We just like don't know, <laughs> but we can guess based on a few different like things, like how many people downloaded the app bundle that there's probably close to a million users of Obsidian and only basically five core members of the team. And eventually from a support standpoint or things, things might start to break and we might need to hire people to help uh, on that front, but we're trying to stay small if we can. Yeah. I think you've been very diplomatic about the VC thing. I mean, in general, it's, you know, you've got, I, I in my coaching practice, you know, I coach a lot of design leaders who are kind of suffering in startups or scale-ups because of the, this constant pressure to scale and because this constant pressure for just more. And, you know, I want a 10X on my, you know, investors want 10X return on their investment in 
some stupid amount of time and things like that. And um, it definitely leads to that, uh, you know, what Cory Doctorow calls the sort of enshittification uh, of that, this thing where there's, then there's a choke point and we have everyone's data on our server and they have to use that up. And then you just start, it becomes a, a sort of process of trying to extract value. And I, I well, you to, touched on a to, thing. Oh, go on, go on. To defend VC, I will say there's some, there's <laughs> some businesses where it's, it kind of is necessary because especially yeah, sure. like we're in a privileged position building software because software has no cost to us, but there are some companies, you know, that have to produce a physical product yeah, in the world and they have to buy the materials and, and put in orders. And so they need to raise money somehow. And VC is one of those paths. I've, you can get loans, like there's different ways. So I think it, I, I'm not like, I just have a kind of a, like a more, zen point of view on that where like i understand why uh, a lot of companies go that direction and it it makes sense i think in the case of what we're trying to build specifically it's a bad fit um yeah. but it's not necessarily a bad fit for everything you mentioned so, i think just now which is oh sorry nicole can I, were you gonna say i was gonna say i'd like to go back to um just a just quickly to what Obsidian is bad at. And you know, mm -hmm. Stefan, I love Obsidian. It is, I am, I'm mm -hmm. all for it. I am possibly the biggest fan. I think one thing that that Obsidian is bad at that I really would love to to see improved is sharing. Mm -hmm. Because I think that is the thing that stops most people from from yeah. using it. Because, you know. Using it in on your own in an isolated way is one thing. It excels at that. But anytime that you have other people that you want to do that with, as an example, Andy and I play D and D. Okay, this is not a work thing, right? But it, it is a recreational use, and honestly, it takes up a lot of my my usage of Obsidian is role playing games. And in that group, there are there are four of us, three and a half, who use Obsidian. We can't share our notes. We can't have like mm. one one repository for all of us to collaborate on. So we have like individual notes. And yes, we could use something like Dropbox to share those notes. But then Andy, for example, can't or wouldn't want to share all of his notes with us. Maybe some of them he would. So I would love, love to see like a little bit more permissions around sharing. Yeah, I think um, sharing is a big, like, it's a challenge because there's like three or four different use cases nested under sharing that are quite different from, from one another. So um, we have publish. So we're doing a lot of work right now actually on making some publish improvements. There's a big batch of publish improvements that just went live like a week or two ago. Mm. Um, and that's more about sharing to the external world an entire vault. Um, and we want to keep improving that. Then there is a uh, sync, which is like, has this concept called shared vaults. I don't know if you've tried that out, but sync shared vaults is actually what we use internally on the Obsidian team. So everyone who's like, you know, between the five of us are working on projects. We, we keep our notes in one shared vault. Then there's also the idea of, hey, I'm writing this uh, note. I just want to send a link to someone so that they can view it. They don't have Obsidian or they don't know, mm. you know, I, I don't want to like put them through the process of having to, uh, you know, learn everything about Obsidian just to read this one note. And that note might be, you know, semi-private. Like it's like something where uh, it's not like a published use case where you want the world to see it. You just want this one person to see it. And then there's the collaboration use case where like uh, Google Docs or Notion makes it really easy for a few people to be like collaboratively editing something, even if they don't or have Obsidian, for example. So like those are all kind of different problems to solve in different ways. And I do think that we want to find ways to solve those problems, figuring out what the right order. That's another challenge about being a, a small team is like, what do we work on now versus later? Um, but I think all of them are problems that we would like to solve, you know, over the kind of medium to long term, for sure. Uh, we're, we're very aware of that. It feels like there's a bit of a thread here, though, as well, when you've talked about, you know, because obviously the sharing bit brings up the privacy issue that you talked about before. Uh, yeah. And it also links to the 
um, is there a, a browser-based version of Obsidian? You know, because one of the ways of obviously easily sharing and collaborating on a document would be to have a kind of browser-based editor, even if it was just for that one document. And it's almost like you need a kind of, instead of a separate vault, a sort of enclave in your existing vault that you can say, oh, this is the shareable bit and all the rest of it, it you know, remains encrypted, let's say, let's say. I don't know if the encryption thing is a, an issue, but, you know, at some point, once you share Correct. it, you have to not do that, right? Um, and that may so be think, yeah. at the beginning of the, of the browser-based version. I think um, my problem is that I am able to do those use cases, but I use separate tools for each of them. I would really love to streamline in this area. Like you were talking about being able to share a link. I use Etherpad with that, but it's it's not the best. It works, though. Um, and then when you talk about using Sync, I also subscribe to Sync, but that also requires other people to have Sync. So for those people who don't use Obsidian enough to warrant Sync, I use Dropbox. And then at work, because we have all of our internal docs on GitHub repos, I use GitHub to, to bring my Obsidian notes and, and share them. And that has that brings a lot of things, but also brings like comments and being able to roll back changes and you know handle merge conflicts. And th that's not something that Sync does as well for now. I, I totally agree. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think that those are things that we have to, to eventually uh, solve. And I, I do, going back to what feels like it should be a core thing and what feels like it should be a community thing, I think that uh, sharing is something that um, belongs in core. At least core needs to have good sharing mechanisms for all of the different use cases. Publishing, collaboration, single note sharing um, is just a, a matter of um, how do we do that? In what order do we build those features? And can we build them in a way that is consistent with our principles? Can we talk about task management? Because that was something mm. that was on the roadmap. So is there anything you can share with us on that front? Uh, yeah, our, our goal around that one is is fairly um, conservative, I would say. It's not going to be a major, uh, you know, complete revamp to everything. It's more about how do we make uh, tasks queryable in, in a better way, like, uh, and also adding better date support. So we've been thinking a lot about how do uh, due dates work with tasks. So right now there's there's ways that you can do that with community plugins, but we want to figure out should should there be a core way of dealing with um, due dates? Again, thinking about um, the API first and how that might um, you know enable developers to come up with some new experiences on top of that. But I would say that that project's been a little bit on the back burner for us because um, we had some other ideas that we wanted to prioritize first, like Canvas and uh, and some of the things that we're working on right now, like metadata and publish improvements, for example. It does occur to me that a lot of these things, like task management, could be helped if you sure locked something like Data Core or Data View, because mm -hmm. the functionality is there. You just need to make it look pretty, but you're good at that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the 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 challenge there is is just again like you know two three people building things we we are we only have so much bandwidth and kind of finding that happy medium between we want to make sure that we're you know releasing features at a good pace but every time we add new capabilities we also add you know add to the surface area of potential bugs of potential issues that might come up or edge cases with certain plugins, yeah. we increase the number of feature requests. Like when we add something like Canvas, then we get a whole bunch of new feature requests from people who are like, oh, Canvas is great, but it doesn't do X, Y, or Z. Um, so that, that I don't know that anyone has ever solved that problem. It's just kind of a problem of building software in the world. But um, that is probably the biggest challenge that we, we deal with as a team is like how to find um, the right balance of what to build now, how 
comprehensive do we want this feature to be versus you know starting small and kind of building on top of it. But Sherlocking a plugin, we tend to when we've done it a couple times, and when we do, we tend to rewrite it from from scratch pretty much. And so that's a pretty big effort, like rewriting something like data view or data. I, I don't I haven't looked at the code for data core. It's, is not a small task. It tends to be a pretty big thing. Another question here by Imagination Scene and another one by another user um, called Remy. What about AI or integrating something like ChatGPT? Is that something that's on your radar? Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. I think that right now, so this is kind of like goes back to the benefit of the extensibility of Obsidian. I'm pretty sure that Obsidian was the first app that had chat GPT or tech uh, like uh, GPT-3 integrated into it because um, someone in the community built a plugin for that called Text Generator. And now I think there's three or four plugins out there that connect to the OpenAI API. So the cool thing for, for, for Obsidian is that because it's so easy to build plugins, people tend to go really like, we, we, we're, we have both have the ability to be very fast and very slow. So the, the community can go and build a plugin that solves that use case. And I, and I think that they're quite good, actually. I've used uh, Text Generator a bunch. But we can also be patient about what's the right way of building it um, for Obsidian. And I think that there's a lot of companies right now rushing into adding GPT to everything. My personal preference when it comes to this is I would like for it to all be local first, completely private. I don't want to send, you know, data that I don't get, like, I want to have complete control over any data that is being sent. Um, you know, there's this concept of uh, training and inference in we, we're getting like right into the weeds of how AI works, but I would like someday to be able to have maybe a plugin, whether it's a, whether it's a core plugin or a community plugin that can do some training on your vault and kind of learn from your vault and be able to do the inference locally on your computer so that it completely aligns with the principles of privacy and local first uh, that Obsidian is known for. The challenge with that right now is that um, that's quite intensive on the graphics card and, uh, it's quite complicated to set up locally for users. And we're still kind of waiting to see whether a company like um, Stability uh, that they made Stable Diffusion and is an open source uh, platform for like image generation. There's been talks about them releasing a language model that would uh, be open source. So we're kind of waiting for all of those things to come together before we make a decision. We would, I think we would prefer to build something that kind of is aligned with our, our principles. But in the meantime, there's a bunch of plugins that you can use that solve that use case. And I think they do quite a good job with them actually. Stefan, have you heard of Napkin? No, I don't know Napkin. Tell me more. It's yeah, it's an it's an awesome service that I've that I recently um, have been using, and it uses AI in a really interesting way because I think there's a lot of focus on using AI for like generating blocks of text or outlines or images. But what Napkin does is it looks at your vault. Well, it's not a vault because it it doesn't do it for Obsidian. It looks at your Readwise highlights and it. Um, uses AI to tag them intelligently. So it has this interface where you can determine, you can click on like a thought or a highlight and it shows you intelligently um, linked other other highlights that you already have that you may not have put together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're like, they're not even using the same keyword or they're not tagged the same way, but somehow it still figures it out. That kind of thing would be invaluable for Obsidian because there's a lot to be said for manually linking things, but getting some help would be nice. Uh, I, I think that sounds awesome. I'm seeing a lot of comments here in the uh, chat of like people who are suggesting some different ideas and some plugins that I, I'm not even aware of that are already doing some more local uh, AI stuff. I think that's a, I think what's 
amazing about the Obsidian community is we have people kind of at every level of the spectrum of nerdiness. Like we have like people who are some of the most advanced engineers that I've ever talked to are developing their own custom plugins. And then we have people who are complete beginners and novices, not engineers, people who are just learning about note taking. We have a lot of young students in the community. And so I like that we have the ability to have those people who are like all the way at the deepest end of like understanding all of those principles, able to start working on, you know, potential plugins and extensions that could do something like that. And that can be kind of a breeding ground where we can learn what do people actually want out of that type of tool. But I do think that if we want to continue to stay true to these kind of principles of being local and private, there's, there's going to be some constraints that we have to deal with that are actual like performance constraints uh, and technical constraints that may mean Obsidian will be a little slower to get to those features than apps that are completely cloud-based where they can offload that to a server and do that, you know, somewhere else. Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's, it, it is a very tricky um, challenge for us to try to solve that right away. I think we're going to tend to watch what plugin developers do and then start to think about that in a year or two. Cause right now there's, I mean, literally every month there's something new going on with, with AI and the open source packages that are going on. So we're, we're maybe a little less cutting edge than, than the, than the plugin ecosystem can be, if that makes sense yeah. on the core side. It feels like, it feels like you could get dependent on something very quickly there as well. And it's going to get really kind of bogged down. Um, and then, you know, a lot of, a couple of people have said, <clears throat> keep that as a plugin. It's much better that way. Um, there was a question, it was from Daniel, uh, garden further up and, um, mm. I don't, I don't use a, a screen reader and, um, but I think, you know, something that would need to be much more sort of core fundamentals, um, as obviously accessibility. I don't know, maybe Daniel can say, I don't know how, um, accessible Obsidian is to use, uh, with screen re readers. We've and, done a lot um, of work in that area are. with, yeah, I, I would be curious to hear a little bit more detail from Daniel, uh, about what they're, what they're looking for, but, um, yeah, Obsidian is already compatible with screen readers. We have done a lot of work on that side but if there's things that are missing in that respect i would say um let us know in the community uh, on the forum or on discord we're definitely i agree that um building that into core is is a must i think that's super important um we we've added a lot of new customization features over the past uh year so i'm actually kind of curious to see if there are themes that get developed that are focused on different use cases. It's much easier today to um, design themes than it was a year ago. Um, in my, one of my, that was one of my biggest contributions over the past year from a code standpoint was rewriting the way that themes can be built. And so that means that you can very easily now create like very high contrast themes, themes with different font sizes, different fonts that um, might help uh, people who have um, you know, who need help on the vision side. Uh, but then there's other things like ARIA labels and other kind of uh, web technologies that we're able to incorporate that make it easier uh, with screen readers for sure. Okay, we have a question that is a little bit controversial. It's from Germ Germain, who I actually by chance met a few a few weeks ago in person. He says, what is his opinion? Well, I, I'm going to ask both of you about tags versus links. Uh, in my personal use or uh, how, how, how do you want to cl clarify that? Yeah, in your like, personal use, which one do you use more? So I tend to use links more than tags personally. Um, so I, I do have a, quite a few tags, but I, I tend to use links because I like to see everything in the, uh, all the relationships in my backlinks, I guess, uh, is, is how, I, how I would say it. Um, and I like that um, links, for example, like I'll have a top, top level categories for um, books that I've read. And so I just have a category called books and I link to it. Um, in my template, I still use tags. I don't actually really know why. I just feel like I should have it there for 
future, future me. Yeah, for future proofing, like if I if I ever create a note about a book, it has both a tag for book and a link to the category books. Um, so that redundancy helps sometimes when I'm if I'm creating like a data view uh, list or something, I have access to both of those different ways of, of filtering down. But I tend to prefer links. I think links have a lot are, are more powerful. Uh, and cross over more different things. I think tags where I use them the most is for kind of very narrow meta segmentation of a very specific thing where there's only a, like a very narrow subset of notes that needs to be grouped in a way that a link wouldn't make sense or I don't really want to have a page for that concept. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still here. But also, I'm still a fan it's not... of folders, you know. Oh, no, I'm very... <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm half the people go, oh, Yeah. I'm very what are you even doing my... here? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I can explain. This is why, this is why I, I, I feel like Obsidian being not dogmatic about this is great because people think in different ways. Like, that's, I, I, I love that people can use folders or tags or links or all of them do whatever works for you if it works for you that's great i think partly it goes back to what you were saying um right at the beginning which is you know in the, where the file format is the thing right and so i use several mm. other things um yeah. on that group of files that i have there and um whilst it, you know it's great if you can search the tags or you can do whatever you want with the uh, tags or links in obsidian when you're trying to pull find a file to kind of pull into something i use marked brett terps terps is marked quite a lot for, for, for output um it's a massive pain in the ass well i mean i use search a lot anyway on the finder but um you know i much prefer to have some organization um that works across other things that aren't going to handle tags so that's, that's well why. to be fair in our in our team vault, we do use folders for for our, our like internal uh, grouping, but I think that 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 use case is very different than my personal notes. Yeah, yeah. We have an answer from Daniel actually. He says he has okay. issues both for Windows and iOS screen reader support. I love the okay. potential well, that let's, Obsidian let's... has for me as a blind person who's already using notes in a text based format. Jump into um, Discord and let's talk about it. Is, oh, how, I don't know how accessible Discord is, by the way. Uh, that's a great question. Because we, we might forum. be saying, so <laughs> jump into something that's really terrible for you to use on Discord. So, um, yeah, or the forum. I'm guessing that's the forum, forum. Is, 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 is runs on Discourse, doesn't it, the forum? I would Correct. imagine yeah. it's kind of more accessible. If you go to obsidian.md slash community, um, you'll see the links there and... Uh, Send us your feedback, or if you want to just email support at obsidian.md, we'll, we'll take a look. But um, the best is definitely through the community, um, and we'll definitely take a look. Yeah. Tell us, who does well, that email go to? I have the three of you. Uh, well, right now, there's, <laughs> it's, it's like a kind of a shared uh, thing where you kind of look in there. But I think that m most people who use the support inbox are for kind of like our enterprise users. Um, we prefer to use the community as the main place because there's yeah. more transparency around that and like other people can jump in and add their own kind of experiences with what whatever the feature request or bug might be so in general that's why we kind of direct people towards the community if they want to provide some feature requests or bug fix uh, uh requests i was kind of hoping it triggered like a kind of a bat signal that projected us an obsidian sort of into the sky, uh, the obsidian crystal into the sky, <laughs> and you all kind of come running. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's just uh, it's just one of those other things that, that as we scale up, we have to find uh, yeah. good ways of of uh, parsing what what the community is looking for and how we can fit it into our um, roadmap. Well, I don't, I would love to have you stay, both of you stay on for longer. You're both welcome back, but I also want to be mindful of your time. So thank you for, for coming on to talk about the future of Obsidian, Stefan, and for helping me interview him, Andy. <laughs> Stefan, is there anything that you'd like to say to the community before we end? Wow. 
Um, thank you. I, I'm, I just, I'm so thankful. I, I think that the thing that um, I love about Obsidian is so many smart people and kind and like uh, kind people are part of the community. I, I love, you know, watching your videos, Nicole, you do such a great job of kind of making obsess uh, Obsidian feel more accessible. And, and I think that in a way like beyond what we're working on in terms of features and so on, like the fact that we have such a, a friendly and collaborative and helpful community is one of my favorite things. And so I'm extremely thankful for that. Um, you know, continue to be, continue doing an amazing job being nice and helpful. Like I think we're still at the very beginning of people adopting these tools. Like anyone who's watching this is probably in the like top 0.01% of people who knows anything about these, whatever you want to call them, tools for thought, how you like some people have been calling it integrated thinking environment. Like we are, we're creating a new generation of tools that help people unlock the, the way that they think. And anyone who's watching this right now is kind of pretty much on the cutting edge of, of that concept. And I'm really curious what happens if that idea becomes more pervasive in society. I'm very hopeful that it can help us solve a lot of big problems. And so if you're, if you're one of the, you know, uh, nerds, I, I say that lovingly, geeks, dorks that are part of this conversation, I consider myself one of those, um, introducing people to Obsidian and being part of, you know, helping uh, them learn how to kind of make their thought process more reliable um, is just an amazing gift. Like, I just think that's like, and you're doing that every day with your videos, um, Nicole. And so I want to, I want to thank you for that. Um, so that it's not an, it's not a specific ask, but that's just kind of the, the way that I feel. And I hope we can continue that for a really long time. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I'll, I'll talk to you both in a second, but we'll say goodbye to everybody else. Thank you for joining us on this weekend and see you next week. Thanks. Bye. bye. Thank you.